What's going on, Washington Commanders Nation? It's your boy Rio Robinson back with the latest and greatest on the Rambling with Rio YouTube channel where we ramble about the Washington Commanders. It is a misery Tuesday, but it's not feeling as miserable as it felt right after the game ended on Sunday. So, you know, I had to bring my guy Lake Lewis Jr. on to recap everything that took place at MT Bank Stadium on Sunday. How are we doing this morning, Lake? I'm good, man. And, you know, I know we've been calling it Victory Tuesday over the last three weeks. But you know what? This is kind of like Victory Junior Tuesday because <laughs> even though they lost and I know neither one of us, you know, support moral victories. Nope. I mean, they, they fared well. They fared mm -hmm. better than the Buffaloes and the Cowboys and teams like that. So I, I'm kind of feeling good about uh, where this team is right now. Loss or not, Washington dropped to four and two and still remain in sole possession of first place in the NFC East. And that division looks like food right now. But the biggest story, I say two biggest stories, a good one and a bad one. The biggest story coming out of Sunday's game was confirmed yesterday. Washington's biggest fears, defensive tackle Jonathan Allen going into his age 30 season has tore his pec muscle. Torres, he tore it up on Sunday versus the Baltimore Ravens. He's going to be out for the season. That Johnny Newton pick is looking real essential right now, right? Uh, it is. And, you know, we 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 both been big fans of Johnny. And, you know, I remember I talked with him a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, it was like he, he feels good. He's getting back. Obviously, the conditioning and stuff is, you know, when you, when you pretty much miss preseason, that's going to happen. So, for him, he's got his four or five games out the way now. And now – it looks like, you know, he could very well start, even though for Darian Mathis could make a case as well. He's balling, too. He's playing I, good. I, absolutely. So I, I kind of think, you know, it, and it's hard to say this because John Allen has been a big part of this organization for the last seven, eight years. John hadn't been playing up to the capabilities that John Allen was capable of. And I think everyone has noticed that. It's not us throwing shade. Uh, so now – you have the new toy who, who we were saying in camp looks a little different from what I've seen at that position here in a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, now you'll get a chance to see it. And I think he's the type of player that needed more reps in order to really become dominant. Um, he's flashed quite a bit in each game he's played and had a big play last week as well. So he's going to get the opportunity to, to show why they took him early um, surprisingly, when you already had two defensive Pro Bowl tackles on your roster. Yep, this could easily look like an Adam Peters special while you take best player available, even with needs on the board. But Darian Mathis, for the first time since he's been in Washington, looks like a guy you need to have out there. So while we ramp up Johnny Newton's snap counts, they can share that role. I think between the two of them, they should be able to put up at least a good majority of what Jonathan Allen's production was, but his, his production was seeing a bit of an uptick over the last couple of weeks. He got his first two sacks of the season. He leads all interior guys on our roster with 13 solo ta uh, tackles so far. Now that means Deron Payne needs to up his play because now you are the sole leader and sole breadwinner of the interior of this defensive line. We got to hear your name called more on Sundays, D. Payne. Yeah, I mean, and, and immediately, uh, you know, once that happened, I was just thinking, you know, now it's going to put a lot more pressure on Duran as far as he's going to have to produce because <laughs> these two young guys we just mentioned could be your two starting tackles going into next season if Duran doesn't do his part now. And all eyes are going to be on him. And, and in defense of Duran, for whatever reason, it seems like when he's solely out there by himself, not with he plays John, better. he plays better. <laughs> and vice versa. John sometimes yep. showed better mm -hmm. uh, because we both know that those guys, as far as the technique, they're not nose tackles like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, they're, they're guys that can do different things. And I think Fedarian now will fall into the role of being the guys going to have to stand people up. But the one thing that I do want to see from Duran that I wanted to see from John as well that I do see from Johnny Newton already. And I do see from, especially from Fedarian. Fedarian plays with passion. He plays mm -hmm. with his emotions yes, for his lead. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want. And, and say what you want about Jerzon Newton or Johnny Newton. 
that kid's motor is always going. He's chasing ball carriers down the field, even if he can't get to them. There's 20 after- yards, 20, 30 yards down the field. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So those two guys, you know, they, they show the effort. They show the motors, the energy. And I just think that that can be contagious, uh, you know, on a defense that at times, you know, you want to see more fire. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing how this plays out. It, as crazy as it sounds, Rio, you know, normally when you say you lose a Pro Bowl player, um, you think it's curtains. I, I don't feel that way this time. I just don't. Um, I, I Obviously, you're going to miss John Allen in some ways. Of course. But but, but the next man up could be <laughs> – it could be the guy that you wanted in there in the first place. Mm-hmm. And not to pull out the next man up cliches and platitudes, but this could end up being a blessing in disguise for this defense because now we're going to get an early measuring stick of what Johnny Newton and what Fedarian Mathis are, both second round picks, and we're trying to close the door of the second round curse of years past. We also had another injury on Sunday. We haven't got confirmed what it is yet. Is it a rib or is it an oblique? What have you heard about Dorrance Armstrong? Please share any insight you have. Yeah, I heard it was a rib. Um, okay. you know, and those things are painful, man. You know, those especially couple days later it's more painful three four days later than it was when it actually happened so uh you know those, those are things that'll limit you a little bit so and, he, and he's been from my money he's been washington's best uh defensive lineman this year yeah. um, you know so now you, you you're you know if he can't play which i highly doubt he would uh play sunday um unless you know there's there's things called shots that happen <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know, know for, quarter zone. <laughs> yeah, but for a guy that's that that plays with strength, you know, Dorrance isn't isn't necessarily a technique guy first. He's just a mm-hmm. strong man. Yep. Um, you know, that, that that has another motor as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've seen Dante Fowler Jr. start to play really well uh, of late. So he had two sacks on Sunday. I mean, so you know, so two pressures. I mean, so now, you know, if Dorrance is out, then you'll see him there. And then obviously Cleveland Farrell's back as well. So I mean, these are the these are the reasons why all those defensive ends were taken. <laughs> you know, just in case something like this happened, you know, you you wouldn't feel like you're totally out of it in the game. Yeah, but let's stop talking about injuries. I know it's Misery Tuesday, but there were a couple bright spots on Sunday for the Washington Commanders. That quarterback of ours, Jaden Daniels, even in a loss, he marvels. He sparkles, he dazzles, and he shines bright versus Lamar Jackson at MT Bank Stadium. 24 for 35, 269 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions, no turnovers, and they were coming after his ass all day long. I would like to say CJ Stroud played against this Ravens defense twice last year. Week one in the playoff, put up zero touchdowns versus Jaden got two touchdowns, no turnovers in one game. How did you feel like Jaden Daniels played on Sunday? Oh, I thought he played really well. Made some tough, tough uh, throws, uh, money throws. You know, the touchdowns to Terry were just two phenomenal throws that a lot of guys just can't make that throw. And I think under the circumstances against who he was playing against, you know, I asked him directly after the game, um, you know, did he feel like, you know, the physicality of Baltimore and their defense, you know, did he see a difference? And he said, yeah, he absolutely saw a difference with that team. So again, you know, for him to play as well as he played under the circumstances of no B Rob, which was, which was hugely felt, you know, you felt that, Um, but on the road against a Super Bowl contender, you you knew it was going to be tough, but he did make some things look really easy for him. And that's always a sign that you want to see. You know, we are, we said this for, for the last several weeks, and I, I keep harping on this. If he is no worse than the second best player on the field, you're going to be in football games. You're going to have a chance to win them. Yeah. Uh, and I will say this, in all due respect for how well Jaden played, he was the third best player on the field on Sunday because Lamar was the best, Derrick Henry was there. But this is the thing. Those are two Hall of Famers mm-hmm. <laughs> that we're talking about. Uh, Ballard. <laughs> and the third and fourth best players on the field were Jaden and Terry. So, and guess they, what? Zay Flowers, Zay Flowers was in that mix Uh-oh, too, bro. He Flowers. was lighting us up. <laughs> Zay Flowers was, but I like, and that's a terrible coverage. So, uh, you, you know, so I, I put Zay Flowers as the fifth best player on the field. But if you have Jaden and Terry making those kind of impacts, 
and you get 20 points, you're supposed to be able to win a football game. They were right there with the Super Bowl contender in their building, and they didn't play particularly well across the board, and yet they still were right there with a Ravens team that I have going to the Super Bowl this year. So I, I just think for fans out there, and most of the fans that I've come across, they're they're looking at this as a positive. Like, you know, I think outside of the DMV, my friend, everybody thought they were going to go up there and get rolled. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> People kept telling me, Lake, you're crazy. They're going to get smoked. Well, no, they did. With 225 left in the game, they had a chance to, you know, try to get the ball and tie the game. Man, we, we all knew that wasn't going to <laughs> well, well, happen. And, and let, let's not to stray here, but I want to get your take on that too, man. Like, we were all like in the building, like, okay, they kicked the field goal. So now that they can try an onside kick. And they kicked off. And I'm saying, that, you're that not getting me. the ball back. That that pissed me off, man. For a team <laughs> okay. that had not got a stop That's since right. the first quarter. Since right. the first quarter, why are we kicking them the ball? You really thought, I guess they were praying to the football gods. Like, somehow the Ravens aren't going to pick up a first down and we're going to get the ball back in five yeah. seconds. We all know what was going to happen if five got the ball back. We all game. did. And they had two timeouts. So, mm -hmm. I guess their thinking was we have two timeouts. If we if we can hold them on two first down, on the on first two uh, downs of the drive, then we have the two-minute warning, which will be our third timeout. They'll punt to us. But I'm thinking you're not getting the football back. I mean, you haven't proven that you can stop Lamar or uh, Derrick Henry all day. And I think the first run was, what, 50 yards? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. But I didn't like the decision to not onside kick, even though you got to do that stupid thing in the NFL now where you have to no. announce it before <laughs> you do it. It, sh it felt like the obvious thing to do because we were never getting the ball back once the Ravens took the field. No stops after the first quarter. But man, oh man, Jaden Daniels is cut from a different cloth from anything I've ever seen play quarterback for my football team. And he's only six weeks in. He looks like a seasoned veteran. Look at the play where he bounced the ball off Austin Eckler's feet in the first half so he can extend the drive because he had to stop the clock on the play. He doesn't look phased. The Ravens said, not only are your running backs not going to run on us, y'all aren't doing that quarterback running stuff on us today. Jaden was our leading rusher with 22 rushing yards. So they completely said, you got to beat us from the pocket. You got to beat us with your arm. And you know what Jaden did? 24-35 for 270 yards, two touchdowns. And we had key drops that swung momentum on the other side. No turnovers. No, no turn turnovers is the biggest thing we harp on each week. Yeah. I mean, when that guy does not turn the football over, which he doesn't. I mean, he's had the two picks, but those were high, as I call them, high quality interceptions. They weren't just terrible throws. So I, I think as long as he's doing that and he's still playing like Jaden Daniels, this football team's going to be really good from it. And, and, and for my money, that Ravens game, that was the toughest game, in my opinion, as on far as team on the schedule. <laughs> and, and I said this, I said this on our post game on ABC after the game. I said it, and I'm sticking by it. I said, not only are they supposed to come back this week and beat Carolina, they're supposed to step on them. Because now you've been beating teams you were supposed to beat. You lost to a team. You probably should have lost to, but you fared well in your defeat and you didn't play your best game against that team. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for me to believe that this team can't run off, you know, the next four out of five games. I mean, legitimately, they have an opportunity. And the only reason I'm saying, <clears throat> excuse me, four out of five is because you just you just can't think that they can win all of them. Yeah. But this is what we're dealing with now when you have a generational talent at the most important position on the field. You have a chance and say what you want about the loss, Rio. Those Ravens players were very complimentary. Uh, Lamar Jackson shut down one of their own media people for trying to make a little deal out of the disrespect. And I, and he's like, no, man, everything that kid's done, he's, he's worthy of it. So, he shot that down. They they earned their, the Ravens' respect. Make no mistake about that. Yep. Lamar Jackson had a lot of compliments to say about Jaden Daniels. Told him, I need that jersey in the jersey swap. Roquan Smith said, 
man, that boy, the truth. He had to stop for a second. He was like, man, that boy Washington is in good hands over there. <laughs> Each week, you're seeing everybody marvel of the play of Jaden Daniels. It was a quarterback showdown at MT Bank Stadium. Our guy graduates, take another step, and we got the Carolina Panthers coming up. My favorite thing about the game Sunday. Did you see Jaden Daniels' face on the sideline when we lost that game? He had that LeBron Eastern Conference final, that Kobe, that Jordan face, like scorched yeah. earth is upcoming. Man, listen, he said it in the press conference after the game. Like, he, he literally said, I don't like losing, <laughs> you know? And but, but then you hear, we just have to go back and watch the tape and get better and keep improving and take this day by day. Man, listen, they have the perfect person to lead them into the future because, as you said, his demeanor is he, he doesn't accept this. And for everyone to say, oh, you're 7-5 and five at LSU last year, he won the Heisman Trophy on a 7-5 and five team. <laughs> that should tell right. you something, uh, and, in, by the way. But it, it just seems like this kid, man, is something he, he's wired a little different if, from the standpoint of the bigger the potential moment the better he plays. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to college. You know, when he was playing Bama, he had his best game before he got injured in that game. Going against Florida in bright lights, he, you know, he had his best game. The Georgia's of the world. So it's almost like, you know, the, the cream rises to the top, as they say. Whenever you would talk about, you know, Kobe and, and Mike and, uh, you know, and, and football, Brady, man, they rose to the occasion in the biggest stages. And that's what Jaden's doing. He just needs to have more people match on, latch on to him, you know, because I, I think what we did see Rio in this game against Baltimore was you saw how Washington's not where they're going to be in two, three years. You, you can clearly see that they're still on the right trajectory. They still have the right people in place. They're, the efforts there, the, you know, everything is a positive, but you can see from a talent standpoint, they're not the Ravens. And that's all you saw. Oh, yeah. And it goes back to his freshman year at Arizona State. Remember when he beat Justin Herbert in that uh, top five Oregon team? Yeah. Uh, he always shows up in the big game. Reigning two-time MVP. He went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, but we got to talk about number eight that plays for Baltimore. Lamar Jackson said, I understand, young buck, you're doing your thing down there in D.C., but I do this thing here, and I'm the reigning MVP for a reason. I got two in my show for a reason. 20 for 26, 323 yards, only six incompletions on the day, a touchdown, a pick, and 40 yards on the ground. Lamar Jackson sat in the pocket and could make himself a sandwich, a drink, watch TV, and complete passes. Talk to me about number eight and what he did to our defense on Sunday. Man, it's, it's Lamar. That's why he's my favorite player in the NFL. And I've made no bones about that for the last four years. Mm -hmm. He, to me, is is my Steph Curry at the NBA. Um, you know, for everyone to take shots about this guy not winning in the big games, he's never really been equipped to win in the big games. Um, last year in the AFC Championship game, terrible play calling by Todd Munkin. You know, what were you thinking trying to do with Patrick Mahomes? You know, so you look at everything that Lamar's done, the two MVPs, the youngest to ever do it, and not really having a true number one threat on the outside of his whole career in Baltimore. Zay Flowers, as great as he is, um, probably shouldn't be your number one if you think about it. <laughs> so you think of everything that he hasn't had. Well, guess what? He's got that sledgehammer and Derrick Henry behind him. And mm -hmm. now you can see Lamar be more calm, more poised. And I think that that's what was on display in this football game against the commanders was that he just looked, in total control at all yeah. times and the runs and it just looked effortless you know it just looked like he was in a light jog out there and he's picking up 40 yards the throws were clear he missed a couple throws in the game which is far but the big plays that he had to make the touchdown in the end zone to andrews you know those are things that we're accustomed to seeing and i think you know, for all the haters out there, you just don't realize you're seeing a you're seeing the best athlete in the NFL in Lamar Jackson. Most electrifying quarterback in the league. Those that are still saying dumb stuff like Lamar Jackson's a running back and even saying similar things to Jaden Daniels. I think ah. my favorite thing about Sunday is that Lamar and Jaden did significantly most of their damage from the pocket. They did it from the pocket, and they picked each other's defenses apart. But, man, Lamar, 
he was finding Zay Flowers, who had like a historic first half. He had a career-defining first half against Washington secondary. Mark Andrews has come up from the dead because Isaiah likely has got the majority of the targets so far this season, he rose up this weekend. Rashad Bateman, 71 yard. Nelson Aguilar, they were dotting us up at all levels of the game. And just when they needed to start killing clock and keeping the ball, they just got a heavy dose of Derrick Henry. And there was nothing Washington could do about it. 484 yards of offense and only nine more plays than the commanders. They commanded 13 more minutes of time of possession. They had the ball for 37 of the 60 minutes played on Sunday. How do you win a football game like that? Man, it, it was it was classic Ravens football. You know, they, they controlled the clock. Uh, you know, they picked up the third down conversions when they needed to. They extended drives. You know, a couple, couple questionable calls on Benji St. Juice. You know, eight Definitely. and some points for them. But – but but Baltimore was clearly the better team, the the, the more well oiled machine, and it started with number eight, and then uh, twenty two behind them. I mean, you know, when you when you have that kind of tandem, you don't know like with the RPOs, you don't know if Lamar gonna keep it, is he gonna hand it off to Henry? You just don't know. But all I know is, come fourth quarter, guys are making business decisions out on the field, and. I dare not say I'm going to Washington's locker room, but there were some guys making business decisions uh, during the game. I mean, it's it's hard to bring down, you know, a man of that size, and then it's hard, man. and then it's hard to contain Lamar because he's cat quick, you know, as well mm -hmm. as fast. So it's like pick your poison in Baltimore. Listen, man, I have them going to the Super Bowl. I keep saying that to me over the last two three years. I think from top to bottom, they've been the best team in football. But I think, you know, naturally in Kansas City, you have Mahomes and you have Andy Reid, you know, which makes a huge difference as well. And, Bal and, and Kansas City's, you know, pretty much built for the playoffs. Baltimore is built for the regular season, the duration of a regular season. They just have to get right in the playoffs if they're going to try to beat Kansas City. But right now, I'm telling you, Baltimore's getting that mojo back where teams are looking at them like, oh, man, they know when they play them, it's going to be a war. And again, that's why I go back to saying Washington answered the bell for me. I mean, they didn't play well. They defense, they played terrible. Let's just call it like that. Mm -hmm. But they still were there with two and a half minutes left in the game, which is surprising. Yep, they hung in there. <clears throat> they hung in there and went blow for blow. I'm not moral victory guy, but if we got an average, if we got a 19th ranked defensive performance on Sunday, Jaden would have got the ball back with a chance to win that game because if we would have scored, I think we might have went for two and tried to get out there with the victory. But we're not going to talk about stipulations that were not able to happen on Sunday. Let's talk about some of the good before we crush the guys who need to get crushed on this defense. You couldn't have started the game better for the Washington Commanders defense. We get our first interception of the season off of the hands of a Ravens receiver. Mikey Sandra still likes nice things. He catches it, gets a good return up to about the 50, and Washington comes in with all the momentum with a turnover very early. Next possession, a fumble was on the ground. Bobby Wagner rushing the quarterback did not look down at the ball. You could have gotten two turnovers to start the game. I look at that Bobby Wagner not looking at the fumble and that Alameda Zacchaeus drop that ended up making Washington punt and pass on points. Those are two things that you cannot survive as a team with as many talent deficiencies as the Washington Commanders. And Dante Fowler Jr. had two sacks on Sunday. That's about all the good I have to say about the defense. Is there anything more you'd like to add before we start talking about this secondary? Nah, you hit it on the head, man. You got to give the offense their their credit. They, they, for the most part, were going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You know, they were moving the ball on a great Ravens defense, you know. Um with no Brian Robinson. And I think that needs to be mentioned. He was missed. You know, I oh, surely was or how much he would be missed in this game, because you just know it's hard to run on the Ravens. That's why they have top ranked run defense, but yep. you still know that he has a little bit of an attitude and a, and a, and a, and a will about him that's infectious for the offense, but the offense did what they needed to do. They put up enough to give themselves to win the game, but it was, it was the other side of the ball that just, 
you know, Frankie Louvu, I don't know if I heard his name all day. No. Nope. You know, surprising considering what he did the you know previous week where I thought he should have been NFC player of the week. He wasn't, but he should have been. Uh, but you know, did not hear his name Sunday pretty much. And then uh, you know, there really was no pass rush, you know, to to the effect of what you needed. Dante Fowler did play well. He did, but I just mean overall. Mm-hmm. The Ravens were able to dictate whatever they wanted to do to Washington. And you're not going to beat a Super Bowl contender when you when they're not uncomfortable at all. Yep. And we know that the secondary is the Achilles heel of this team. We tried to sell for the run. We're playing a lot of extra safety looks with Percy Butler joining Quan Martin and Jeremy Chen on the field. But what that did was it allowed us to get gassed up front in the run game and it allowed us to give up crossing patterns galore to Zay Flowers so Rashad Bateman and Nelson Aguilar and they were just running the same con it felt like they were running the mesh concept all first half the same the same thing Rio and I'm sitting there like just I don't have any hair to pull but I'm sitting there like Joe like what do you Joe what I'm talking about like mm-hmm. come on man you, you you're gonna have to put Mikey on Zay Flowers and he did do that in the second mm-hmm. half and we didn't hear Zay Flowers call too often after that. So that was, that was smart recognition, but it was a little too late when it happened. Um, you can't have Benji St. Juice checking Zay Flowers, man. You just – he's not built to, to – he's not twitchy like that to cover a guy like that. And it just seems like what we're, what we're really being exposed to on the back end of Washington's defense from safeties as well as corners, mm-hmm. they don't really have – ball hawks ball playmakers eyes to get to the ball in the air trackers they have hitters they have guys that are short tacklers all yep. over the field back there mm-hmm. but when you can't get to a zay flowers type player um there's nothing you can do and i think that that's a problem for them that i, I don't know if they make a move for a, a, a corner but it does it does seem like if you can get yourself a corner in this defense. I'm talking about a, a lockdown corner in this defense, and and a, and a, and, a, and an elite pass rushers. I, I can see how Joe Woods' defense would work, but right now they just don't have the pieces for it. They just don't. We don't got the horses, and like Benjamin St. Juice, <laughs> as much as I want to question the calls against him, the two penalties that extended drives for the Raven. Your, rep- your reputation precedes you when you're a grabby, right. pass interference type cornerback. So they know who you are. They got the scouting report on you, St. Jude. So if it looks like it, they're going to call it. I'm not going to sit here and talk about the calls they missed against Washington because Washington lost that game on Sunday. The Zebras did not decide whether we won or lost that game. 100%. But when you got a cornerback room where your best corner currently is Noah Igbenogany. You're going to have some trouble on Sunday, but shout out to Noah, though. He's playing solid football for this team. What does it say about Emmanuel Forbes that you can't even dress on the worst cornerback room in the league? It just, it's just another Ron Rivera pick, man, that you just, you know, I, I told somebody the other day, put this in perspective as far as what you haven't gotten out of Rivera's first round draft picks let's think ahead what we potentially think we're going to see with Adam Peters four first round draft picks <laughs> I mean there's that tells you everything we're speculating going forward in the future that we know you're going to get four really good football players at, at first round the four that Washington has taken with Ron Rivera there's nothing to show for him uh Dotson's not here Chase isn't here. Emmanuel Forbes isn't playing. And who else am I missing here? Jamin Davis, who can't even get John <laughs> Baptiste, a seventh round right. pick off the field. Inactive. And that's that's what I'm saying. I'm just sitting here like, and I, I'm an insider with the team, and I'm like, okay, I'm missing somebody here. You already can see this draft class from this year, their first round pick. I mean, come on. <laughs> He's one of the best in the league. Um, their second round pick. Um has shown a lot and now getting ready to start their third round pick, their fourth round pick. I mean, you, you going all the way down to seventh and, 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 and John Baptiste, I mean, he's out there still doing stuff. You know, he has a sack this year. So mm-hmm. man, it's he's just keeping Jamin a first round pick off the field. Exactly. It's, it just goes to show you 
that you can't miss on these on these type of players, not first rounders. And for them to be getting nothing from Emmanuel Forbes, I mean nothing. That's that's bad, man. Those are the kind of things that set set programs back. You know, it, it sets a cycle back. And you know, so now you're seeing why they're struggling uh, in their secondary because their first round draft pick. And to put that in perspective, look at the other first round draft picks in the class with him. If you had any of those guys on this <laughs> defense, it would be markedly different. Yeah, so to not be able to dress in this roster with this cornerback room oh, is yeah. the biggest indictment of all that you may not be built for this league, my friend. And Washington may have to try to take nasty value just to cut bait with him and possibly Jamin Davis. I know fans got excited because they saw him make a play in the preseason and they saw him make a play in week one. These guys are not dressing for a reason here. Same thing with Derek Forrest. They're not dressing for a reason. They cannot force Ron Rivera's blunder onto the field. In totality, how would you grade Washington's defense versus the Ravens? Ah, that's tough, man. I probably would go C minus. Um, the effort was there. I mean, guys were trying. They really were. But it was just, you know, lack of communication out there. And, uh, you know, I, I might just go, I might go C uh, because, you know, Baltimore did have, you know, one of the top one or two D, uh, offenses with Washington. So mm -hmm. I, I'm probably going to change it to a, just a C. Uh, because, you know, Dante Fowler, you know, he had two sacks. You know, they did have a couple balls on the ground that they could have recovered, which they didn't. But they are stripping guys. You are they are going after stuff. The one, obviously, you know, uh, uh, center snapped it off his leg. You know, yeah. Bobby Wagner jumped like right over the ball because he was looking at Lamar. So I don't blame him on that. Oh, but yeah. those are the type of type of turnovers that you have to make, as you said. You know, if you're going to beat a really good football team in their building, you have to play an A game, and Washington didn't play an A game. I think offensively they played a B, a, a B. I give them a solid B, um, but defensively, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a C, C minus. I just hate losing a game to a team of this magnitude in which you won the turnover margin. We forced the turnover. We did not commit any turnovers, and Jaden just didn't get a chance to tie the game up. You know, he didn't. He just they didn't. Went chance to work his magic and, and 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 kudos you know those were his words actually that he said afterwards kudos to the Ravens defense because you know they did they made a concerted effort to keep him um you know in between the tackles and, and you think about it you know Roquan Smith was shadowing him in the middle of the field mm -hmm. the whole game Stop a him. pro bowl run, uh, uh, linebacker was shadowing Jaden Daniels and then they, you, you clearly can see that they told, you know, Matabuike and, and their edge rushers and guys like that to stay, you know, home. Do not let him get to the edge. And I don't know if that's going to be a blueprint going forward against Jaden. Um, I don't know if defenses can run it like the Ravens, but it, it was effective. It sure was. I'm going to give him a D. I'm not going to quite give him an F, even though I want to, but I know what the Ravens do. That is an MVP quarterback, MVP candidate, offensive uh, player of the year at running back. Zay Flowers, that one makes me want to give them an F because Zay Flowers is cool, but Zay Flowers not like that, man. <laughs> we have Zay Flowers looking like Tariq Hill on Sunday. Yeah. 100 in the second quarter. <laughs> At 120 on our head tops in a quarter and a half of football. He looked like the second coming of Tariq Hill. I want to give him an F. I'm going to give him a D for the day. Ultimately, a D is a C minus. Yeah, a D is, it's all the same thing. It's all the same. <laughs> you bring it home to your parents, they're going to be the same amount of disappointed as gonna you. You're going to get a beat regardless. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But moving over to the offensive side of the ball, we've already marveled over the quarterback. Terry McLaurin, yardage will not show how well he played on Sunday. Those two touchdowns were so big time. That 5-17 to 17 connection is starting to work magic already. Yeah, man. And, you know, I'm going to harp on it again for all your viewers. That's what we were saying. We were right. saying, know what a number one looks like because they're making plays. They're making plays that most can't make. Terry's making plays that a lot of receivers can't make. You know, the catches that he's making, 
uh, the body catches because that's what he does mm-hmm. are just they're they're exceptional. You know, the catch in the end zone, uh, keep his feet in was great, but then come back later in the fourth to make that catch with coverage draped all over you. That was ridiculous. It was great, and it was a hell of a throw from Jaden to put it right in the only spot that Terry mm-hmm. could try to catch it. So you're seeing that tandem become something. It really is. And, and, and once, you know, B-Rob can come back and they can get back to doing things, let's face it, Rio, they're going to have to start out just outscoring everybody they play in order to win football games. Absolutely. That play on that fourth and goal, that shouldn't have been a fourth and goal because Zach Ertz should have gotten the end zone, but we're not going to go there right now. Terry McClellan, Jaden pumps to get the defender guessing, and then off the pump, the ball is on a string to Terry and only a place right over the DB shoulder in the goal. Oh, that was a beautiful touchdown. I don't care about the yards right now. I care more about the touchdowns and Terry already has matched his touchdown total from last season. And he's three off his career high total of seven touchdowns in a season. Okay. He has four <laughs> he, sh- he should get it easily. He should get 10 touchdowns this year because Jaden is looking for him early and often. Another receiver I want to talk about. Noah Brown has been so perfect of a wide receiver, too, since he's been here. That guy makes all the hard catches. He will take the hit, and he catches with his fingertips. Man, talk to me about 85. You know, I think when you look at Noah Brown, and even Terry a little bit, but especially with Noah Brown, Noah Brown looks like the type of receiver that would fit on the 49ers, you know, style of ruggedness and play. Um, And and that's where Adam Peters came from. So he knows what he's looking for as far as his receivers. He wants tough receivers. And Terry and Noah fit the, you know, Ayuk and Debo, uh, you know, type of stature out Mm -hmm. on the field. And, and And I do believe Noah's played so well. That's why they haven't filled any opportunities to go out and get, you know, Devonta Adams, who's now obviously in New York. And then, of course, um, you know, a guy like Christian Kirk, because Jacksonville is getting ready to have a fire sale, too. I don't think they need anything else on offense. I just don't. They just need more time to keep playing with each other because everything has been working. That's why they're one of the top offenses. And I think once they uh, got Noah Brown, it solidified their offense because he's made some tough catches. And remember, he was making catches before Terry really started to get going. Yep. And now that it's there, it's just it's just a good look for them. I like him a lot. He's 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 entrenched as this team's number two receiver. Yep. And on third down, I'm looking no further than 85. 85 has been our reliable third down target for this team. He's making the hard catches. He'll stretch out and get it. He'll jump up and get it. And we haven't seen any problem with the dropsies. Alameda Zacchaeus had a big drop early in this game. One of them, he had two actually, but one of them, Jaden threw it behind him, but you still got to catch that. But the second drop, started a slippery slope of bad events that this team is not able to overcome with this deficit of talent at this point. But it was the number one and number two receiver, and it was Zach Ertz and Jaden Daniels on Sunday. Zach Ertz, four for 68. We weren't able to find him early, but in the second half, Jaden made some big-time throws to Zach Ertz. He definitely, you can tell he's a mid-30s tight end because he has nothing to offer after the ball is in his hands, but he's catching the passes. I don't know how he didn't get in the end zone on that one pass. looked like he put that by the end zone and, and ran parallel. Yeah, he ran. He ran. ran, Hurt your body. (laughs) He started to run horizontally, sir. (laughs) Get in the end zone. I'm not sure how he did, but I'm glad Terry ended up getting a touchdown. But we took minutes off the clock because he didn't get in. I think Jaden may be. He probably leads the NFL in receivers stopped within the two yard line because I've seen it at least seven times this season. Yeah, I mean, it, it's happened so frequently. It's it's like <laughs> there, there's some kind of magnet repelling them, you know, at, at the goal line. It's just like they don't want to cross it. And think about it, you know, think of how many more touchdown passes Jaden has this year if those guys could get over that goal line. I, I think I'm looking at right off the top of my head four more. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, it's been more than that. Crazy. <laughs> oh, oh, now, now you're starting to put yourself, you know, if he has four or five more touchdown passes – 
Um, he wouldn't be like a top five MVP candidate. He'd be up in the in, in the running for things, and they probably would have won some more games too. So I, I I just think for right now, with everything that's going on, you're gonna have to have Zach Ertz, Terry, and Noah Brown really kind of carry you home here um, down the stretch. Luke McCaffrey's really playing well as a young guy, uh, but but yeah, I mean, I think that they're gonna open it up even more. And you know this, Rio. He's learned the playbook. He knows the playbook. And he's now that he's asserted himself in, across this league, you're going to see more from Jaden Daniels coming up. So I expect them at times to, you know, just to have him throw deep a little bit more. I, I would have liked to have seen that against Baltimore, actually. Uh, but I guess, you know, when you don't have a whole lot of time, because they were bringing the heat to him yeah. early, often, you know, but, but I like what I'm seeing from all those guys and especially Noah. I know that that six to two touchdown to interception ratio should look more like 11 to two because I've seen Luke McCaffrey get stopped within the two twice. I've seen Noah Brown get stopped there. I've seen Terry McLaurin get stopped there. I've seen Zach Ertz get stopped. And that is five would have, should have, could have touchdowns, but I don't, I'm not going to sit here with revisionist history about that. How much did Washington miss the services of Brian Robinson Jr. on Sunday? Oh, they missed it a lot. You know, they missed it. They missed obviously the 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 tough running in between the tackles. Uh, but but Ryan can catch the ball out the backfield too. Um, and he's also a really good blocker. You know, p- picking up blitzes and things like that. So they just missed his energy and his will. Because one thing about Brian is, you know, he plays with a lot of passion. He does. And, you know, that stuff's contagious. Austin, you know, is a fire guy, but but you know, he's. You know, he, he's not Brian as far as that kind of category. Right. And I think that it, it, it changed how they used Austin as well as they didn't do a whole lot with Jeremy McNichols, which I was surprised about because I okay. thought that we would see more of, of both of them. And, yeah, the Ravens are so good at running. I'm not sure if Cliff really wanted to challenge them early in the run department because it looked like they came out with those bubble screens again, which I'm like, can we please not do that? Um, run the football, see what you can do. But I think maybe with, without B. Rob, it, it just it just changed everything, how they thought they could attack the Ravens defense. And I, for one, thought we were going to be fine because I'm like, Jeremy McNichols is running the pill. Austin Eckler can handle the workload um, as the number one bell cow guy, sometimes they sold on the run and we were able to get nothing. Austin Eckler, 21 yard. Jerry McNichols, only two carries. We decided <laughs> running was not going to be an option very early in this game. And Cliff Kingsbury had a very shaky start calling plays early on, but he eventually settled in and our offense started clicking again as it normally has regularly scheduled programming. We gave up three sacks, but all in all, I think our offensive line fared pretty well on Sunday versus the Ravens. No, I do too. I mean, again, you're talking about one of the best defensive fronts, one of the best defenses in the league. And I know the Ravens have been gassed, you know, through the air uh, this season. Uh, Secondary was a little shaky at times. But still, you know, Marlon Humphreys, uh, Kyle Hamilton, those are Pro Bowl players on the back end. So you just knew that the Ravens were going to come out this game and, and have the attention of Jaden Daniels, you know, they you, you, you could tell that they were focused coming off that. And what did they, I think they gave up 37 to Cincinnati the week before and mm-hmm. Jamar Chase yep. doing everything he wanted to them. So I just think that you knew that they were going to bring their A game defensively. So I think for Washington's offensive line to really kind of match that physicality and keep Washington within a chance to tie the game late in the game, you have to give that offensive line credit again, because They're doing their job. They just couldn't create too many lanes as far as the run game. But again, your starter wasn't in the game and be robbed. So in totality, I'm no Nick Allegretti got beat more than I would have liked to on Sunday, but it happens versus a team like the Ravens who actually have the bodies and talent in place. I will say that Wiley Wiley did not have one of those games. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, But as a whole, the offensive line definitely still played a fine game. What are you grading the commander's offense versus the Ravens? Oh, man, I'm giving them a – I'm going to give them a B plus. And the reason why I say that is because that's a really good defense. You were in their building, and you were without, you know, one of your key proponents or uh, components on offense and Brian Robinson, and yet you still had a chance to tie this game late in the fourth quarter – so I'm going to give them a, a, a B plus, man. And I say that because 
there was never a moment in the game where you just felt like the offense was just totally outclassed. I never felt that. I mean, nope. even when they had to punt, you know, it just – they were moving the ball. If, if, mm-hmm. if they can get guys to finish, like you said, finish some of these plays over the end zone, it's a whole nother game at this point. But, but the throws from Jaden and Terry and Noah Brown had a big game. Zach came on late in the game. Listen, you got to give them credit where credit is due. They went up against a monster, and they 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 fought tooth and nail with them. Yep, I'll give them like a B. I'll give them like an eighty-six out of one hundred B, and that's, that's only. But be- yep, I'm grading on a curve because you know, like we were one dimensional, and Washington hasn't had to be one dimensional at any point this season. We had to be versus the Ravens because they completely sold for the run and. Everybody wanted to know, what does Jaden look like if he has to throw the ball 35 to 40 times? You know what he looked like? He looked very quarterbacky. He looked very unfazed, and he looked very poised. Even took some big shots from Kyle Hamilton. Should have been a penalty. Should have. Big... <laughs> definitely should have been, definitely was, should have been a flag. That was target. <laughs> that, that was the... When you know when they when they put target targeting in the dictionary, that should have been the picture of Kyle Hamilton launching himself with yeah. his um against a defenseless quarterback. So yeah, that should have been a penalty. Uh, you know, and, and again, Jaden answered the bell, you know, and you and I both know he didn't have his best game, and he still was good. Oh no. <laughs> That that's the thing. He didn't have his best game against a really good defense, a Super Bowl contender, and yet they still were right there. That's why I keep telling the fans, man, this guy gives you hope every week, every week. And now going forward, there's there's no reason to think that Washington not just can, but probably should win the NFC East if they can continue with the trajectory of Jaden Daniels. And that is the perfect segue because that's how we're going to close out this one. We're going to talk about the we're going to talk about how the division stacks up currently. But Jaden separately, I'm giving him a B plus for Sunday. The whole offense, I'm going to give them a B. He kept us in it. And with five on the field, we can beat anybody that shows up on the schedule. And I think we just got our best opponent left on the schedule out the way on Sunday versus the Ravens as we currently sit at four and two with a three and two Eagles team, a three and three Dallas team that looks awful, who got ran off their field on Sunday by the Detroit Lions and the Giants. They just need a quarterback. If they had Jaden Daniels, they'd be spooky right now. Thank God for Washington. They do not. We're looking at a schedule coming up with Carolina, Chicago, the, uh, the Giants on the road, the Steelers, the Eagles, and the Cowboys. Washington has an advantage, man. Now that I look at it. That's what I was saying, man. Those are all winnable football games. And I'm and and and, and I'm going to put the word should in there. Uh, out of those, what, six games you just named? Yep. They should win four of them. I yep. mean, I'm saying that's, that, that makes you what, eight and four? Eight and four on the back end. And then you got the Titans, the Saints, the Falcons, and then your two divisional opponents again. Man, that makes that makes the 11-win drought come up. Like, why not? Listen, man, you remember early in the year when you – before the season, actually, you asked me, what did I think of this football team? And I said they're no worse than a nine-win football team. Got the receipts to show. Mm-hmm. I Listen, I knew what I was seeing, and I also said that the Eagles would win the division. I did say that, but I thought Washington would be second. It, it could very well play that play itself out, but the problem is now when I watched the Eagles, and, you know, when I went back and looked at their game, obviously couldn't see it being in Baltimore, but when I went and watched it, they look bad. They do. <laughs> their fans were calling for their coach even though they won the game. They don't look like a team that puts fear in you. And I understand they're working A.J. Brown back and Devonta Smith has been out. I get all of that. But that that lure that the Eagles used to used to have, that that mystique that they they were building with yeah. um, with Jalen Hurts. Once the 49ers went in there and just beat them down, they have not been the same. They're a shell of what they were. And th- that tells me to Washington as far as the, the most complete team is that's playing with a passion to win 
and having the most electrifying player on the field out of all of those four teams in the division, it's right here in D.C. <laughs> it's not just who we're playing. We've watched the whole division play the Cleveland Browns. No one spanked them like we spanked them offensively not and defensively. Not at all. And you still have to think. Philly still has Baltimore. Um, they still have some. So we already have the toughest game on our schedule out the way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've played. And see, this is the thing when people say you haven't played anyone. They Washington out of their first five games played two playoff teams from last year. Like two divisional at worst round playoff teams in Tampa and Baltimore. Baltimore was an AFC mm -hmm. championship game. Yeah, and you, Cleveland, Cleveland was in the playoffs last year. Oh, well, you're right. Cleveland was in the playoffs last year. So they they played some teams that most people would have said they were going to lose to, and they, mm -hmm. they destroyed Cleveland, okay? So now you look ahead, the Panthers and, you know, the Bears. I do think that Bears game is going to be a tough football game. because I wish playing. it was on primetime because Caleb's uh, stupid. I know. They're playing really well, <laughs> but it's here. And, again, if you want to beat – you know, teams to get to the playoffs and, and make yourself a viable threat. Um, I don't think there's any reason for anyone out there to think that Washington can't end up legitimately as a number two seed, number three seed at worst, if they can play the way they've been playing. Yeah, and we're looking at how the division looks. Dallas has no identity on either side of the ball right now. The $60 million man had to get benched on Sunday. Jalen Hurts and the Eagles are stumbling and barely getting across the finish line. Their coach is a joke. Nick Sirianni, they're ready to run him out of town and not even see the rest of the season be played. And the Giants just, they're, they're held to a cap because of Daniel Jones. We get the Giants again. We have five divisional games upcoming. Two to Philly. Two to Dallas, one to the Giants. If we handle business in the division and get three out of those five games, split with the other two and sweep the Giants, all it will take is another three to get the 10 wins and another four to get to 11. You got the Tennessee Titans up on the schedule. You got the Saints. That's a winnable game. The Falcons are playing ball. That's a winnable game. The Steelers are a phenomenal defense. That's a winnable game because they're anemic on the offensive side of the ball. Every game coming up for Washington is winnable, man. I don't want to go too far, jump out of my skis just yet. But 11 ain't never looked this possible in Washington. It hasn't. And, you know, you haven't, you've haven't. you never seen that in your lifetime, actually. I have not. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> There's only team in the league that doesn't have 11 wins since, oh, what, 30 years. But yeah, 91, my birth year. We're the only team that hasn't six. <laughs> yeah, so, so they have an opportunity. They really do. But I'll say this. Nine wins wins the division for in the NFC East. So I don't even think you need to get to 11. Um, mm -hmm. Nine wins to secure the division. Ten wins guarantees you winning the division. And if you think about it, like we just said, over their next six games, if, if, you, if you win four of those games, you're, you're almost a game out from from winning the division <laughs> yeah. so this thing is real man and i don't think you know the loss to the ravens should make anyone think oh we were seeing smoke and mirrors no man you, you're seeing a young team ascending and as like we said as long as you have number five back there it's just like baltimore's number eight as long as you have those clear better athletes on the field at all times playing their game and Jaden is an exceptional passer on top of it I just think that they have a chance to win every game they play. I'm not saying they're going to be favored in every game, but there probably won't be too many games if they were to go out and reel off another two, three in a row that they won't be favored in. The most valuable asset you can have in the NFL in 2024 is a transcendent talent at the quarterback position on a rookie contract. Washington is set to have a bunch of money, a bunch of picks. Do you think you don't have to get into specifics about position or specific player? Do you think Adam Peters makes a move to be a buyer at the deadline? I do. I do. I, because I think I think the Raven game proved to him. Damn, we're really not that far off. And, and I mean that like you hung with a Super Bowl caliber team in their building and you didn't play well. So one thing you do know about him is he wants to win and he wants to win not next week or next year, but he wants to win now. Now. Mm -hmm. And there's only 
a certain amount of opportunities you have to do this. You know, nothing's guaranteed for next year, even though the future looks bright with all the cap money, with Jaden, you know, draft picks, nothing's guaranteed. But what is guaranteed is that this team has put themselves in, in a fair position to try to make the playoffs. And I think, you know, if you can go out and get yourself a corner, I do think that that's clearly what they have to look into. And, and I know there were some grumblings about Max Crosby. They're, they're not getting Max Crosby. They're not trading. They're, no. stop <laughs> they're not trading the future for a player uh, that'll be approaching, what, 28, 29. You just don't mm -hmm. need to do that at this point. Um, but I do think that you can go out and get yourself an upgrade at, at corner. And, and I'm surprised because – you know, you, you had an opportunity, and now Minnesota plucked him, and he goes out and gets an interception. Gilmore. Last. Gilmore, Stephon Gilmore. You know, I was surprised they never made a move on that. Um, but maybe there's somebody else out there. I mean, if you can if you can trade a third, because they have more picks this year, if you can trade a third and get yourself a top-flight corner that, you know, a team is trying to move because they're not going anywhere, I think that upgrades Washington's defense overnight. I think we're going to at least try to get a corner. As much as we think that um, starting cornerbacks grow on trees, they that's don't. not a position where a lot of them are available. So if maybe you can talk to the Browns about a Greg Newsome, J.C. Horn with the Panthers. It's one of these fire-selling franchise, the other corner in Cincinnati opposite Taylor Britt. I forgot his name off the top of my head. Adam Peters is working the phone. We have a real GM, guys. If there's a starting <laughs> cornerback available, that it for feasible value, Adam Peters will have him here in DC because while we're ahead of schedule and this is still an evaluation season, we actually have a chance to make some noise in 2024 because with five on the field, you got a shot versus every team in this league. Last question, and we can get out of here. Does Washington fall into the proverbial trap game versus the Panthers this week, or do they come in? and spank them like a good team is supposed to and put 40 or 50 up on Sunday? I think they spank them like they're supposed to. And I say that because, again, when you have number five, there are no more trap games. They're, they're, you're feared now. <laughs> like, you have a guy that's like you and I joked about a couple weeks ago. You have a guy that's going to break up happy homes now because defensive coordinators aren't going to spend any time with their wives because they're going to mm -hmm. be watching tape on this kid, and it's going to end marriages. That's what you need, and I think as long as you have that, when you play a team that's not good, you'll, you'll see how good he is. And I, I understand, the, the, what is it, the red rifle and everything. Andy Dalton has been, you know, making, making Carolina look like a serviceable professional team, but there's no way they should come into Washington and beat, and beat the commanders. I think Washington realized – after the game against Baltimore, more so than the wins that they had the three games before, I think this loss irked them. I think they felt like, man, we had a chance to beat this team up here and we didn't play well. So I think that got their attention more than the wins. And I think it woke them up even more to say, you know what, we're, we're actually pretty good here. I think guys believe that they're actually a good football team, even though they have their deficiencies on the defensive side of the ball they know that they're a good football team. And I think the defense is feels some type of way as far as their performance on Sunday that I think they can unleash some things, some anger, like we saw against the Clevelands, like we saw against the Arizonas. They can do that to Carolina for sure. I think Washington is at the stage of our development where we're allowed a get right game. And this is the tune up for Chicago, baby. Let's get back right. Let's let the defense attack. Let's release the hounds on Andy Dalton. I'm sorry. You cannot lose to this football team. I know Deontay Johnson is a good receiver. I know Xavier Leggett shows a lot of promise. Chuba Hubbard, all that. This team stinks. This team is owned by Dan Snyder 2.0. You better beat the drums off these. Do not beat them how Philadelphia just beat the Cleveland Browns on Sunday. This team doesn't even want to win because they want to start over again and get a quarterback next year because it didn't work out with Bryce Young over these first a year and a half that he's been with the team. I better see 30 plus points put up and I better not see more than 20 points scored on the other side. I don't think it's going to be a trap game. I saw Jaden's face after losing to Baltimore on Sunday. He probably had 
Panthers defense on his VR set on the bus ride back in the Napa Way buses from MNT Bank Stadium. Appreciate you for coming by as you do each week. Late, let people know what they where they can find you or if you got anything special planned on the podcast anytime soon. Yeah, you know, um, definitely you can follow me on social media, Lake Lewis Jr. Um, you can check out my podcast, The Lake Lewis Jr. Show, actually firing that up today. Or we'll talk about, you know, Washington and what they have to look forward to coming ahead. And uh, I think B. Mitch is coming on for me today. So we can get, get, get a chance to kind of fire it up. And, and I know I keep saying this, but it's just been so hectic, man, later in the week. Um, but I got to get you on on Friday for sure. Hey, let uh, me know, man. Because uh, I, I do predictions on Friday, so I kind of put you out there. So I need score. I need player of the game. I need everything. So we'll do that on Friday. Um, and, of course, you can go to sportsjourney.com and see some work on there. And then uh, you can catch me locally on, on some local television. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Like, I appreciate you for coming by. It was a misery Tuesday, but it didn't feel so miserable because Washington actually – actually held their own on Sunday versus Baltimore. Get right week coming up for the Commanders. Thank you all for watching. This is Rambling About Washington. Until next time, Rio and Lake, we are out.